a lot of us will be familiar with the language of privilege. This language has become commonplace anytime we have discussions about systemic injustices or our individual experiences of them. Yet, despite so many of us being well versed in this concept, we still don't know quite what to do with it. And I would argue that this is by design. The language of privilege and the people and institutions that privilege it creates an environment of shame and fear that naturally leads to inaction. Certainly, this is not everyone's intention, but I do think we need to reckon with the impacts that this discourse has had on us. Hey, my name is Renya, and I'm an anarchist therapist, although I'm probably not your anarchist therapist, so please keep that in mind when you're leaving comments, which I would very much like to encourage you to do, to leave comments with your thoughts, and you can use they, them pronouns when referring to me. Enjoy the video. I'm making this video because we need to have a language to talk about our shared experiences and the ways that our experiences are different with regards to harmful systems, systems of oppression, and the language of privilege is often one of those first tools or the first frameworks that we reach for. It's something a lot of us are familiar with. And, you know, theoretically it can describe the way that systems impact different people differently. Um, Yet, in my view, a lot of the way that this language is used is very imprecise and it can sort of close down dialogue, close down conversations rather than open that up. A lot of the time I see this play out along the lines of people who might be more liberal compared to people who might be more radical. So liberals, um, who are people who, you know, see the system, see that it's not quite working and like want to make some tweaks so that it can work a little better. Whereas radicals are the people who say the system is never going to work because it's set up to, to sort of harm us in this way. So we should get rid of the system. That's more on the side I would fall. Um, liberals are more likely to use this language of privilege because it is a liberal framework. It centers the experience of the individual rather than the operations of the systems that impact individuals. And radicals tend to understand this, um, but I don't know if we have like a sort of clear clarity around um, our critique. So this video is my attempt to do that. Um, I hope that it's generative to be explicit. This video is in conversation with my previous video, Say the Right Thing, where privilege is in many ways the right thing that we're expected to say, that we're expected to use to frame our conversations. So in this video I'll be saying what is for some people the wrong thing, but is for me something that is needed to be said. And I'm certainly not the first person to advance this perspective. Um, I'm also in conversation with um, Anarcho Relating's video on semantics. So for those of you who found me from that video where they um, talked about me, um, welcome, I'm glad you're here. Um, I think that this lack of semantic alignment with our use of the word privilege is a lot of what's causing the problem. So I hope by providing um, some history and some exploration of our current usage of this term, we'll maybe get somewhere in terms of how we use it and why that's not quite working for us. We're going to start with a conversation of the nonprofit industrial complex and actually what is before that, right? What led to it? So I'm going to frame this around one central figure, Peggy McIntosh, who's writing um, sort of gave birth to this concept of privilege. We're going to look at like what is the historical context that came before her that she would have been writing in, what did she actually say, and then you know sort of what came out of that. This history that I'm sharing is very abridged. I would urge you to do further research if this interests you. So pre-Peggy, um, looking at um, the history of in particular colonization and white supremacy in the United States, 
which is where Peggy was writing. So, of course, we have the history of the transatlantic slave trade and how that, you know, contributed to providing a, a workforce for colonizers in the United States. Um, throughout this time, there was constant slave revolts. Uh, I don't know about you, but for me, growing up in the American education system, that was often left out of my education. The frequency and um, the resistance of slaves. And in particular, there was a successful slave revolt and a revolution in Haiti. And in particular, plantation owners in the US South were very afraid of that and that intensified their repression. In the early 1860s, we have the Civil War in the United States. Um, that was coming out of these changing economic conditions that started to differentiate the economies of the North and the South of the United States, as well as slavery abolitionists who were advocating for an end to slavery. So, you know, this demand to end slavery didn't come from nowhere. There were abolitionists who were writing, who were staging protests, who were, you know, pressuring for this to end. And it pushed all the way up to President Abraham Lincoln, who was not particularly interested in abolishing slavery, right? Like the economic situation in the United States was working if you had power and if you were white and if you were not a slave. So Abraham Lincoln, for him, it was like, okay, things are sort of going fine, um, but it had reached a point of conflict where he needed to resolve that conflict. And so he came out on the side of um, the abolitionists because they had successfully pressured him. The North, won that war and so after that period there was reconstruction reconstruction was about um reparations like giving reparations to the formerly enslaved and freeing those slaves giving them economic opportunities allowing them to migrate freely where previously that had been not allowed um and so reconstruction was heavily hampered by the resistance of white people and the Ku Klux Klan. Um, and in particular in the South, but to be very clear, not just in the South, that Reconstruction was hampered by the resistance of white people. Um, W.E.B. Du Bois writes in the psychological, so W.E.B. Du, du Bois is writing about the history of Reconstruction um, in 1935, this book called Black Reconstruction in America. And um, he talks about the psychological wage of whiteness, which is sort of like what white working class people received in order to encourage them not to ally themselves with black working class people. Because, you know, the white working class or the white ruling class knew that if there was an interracial alliance of working class people, that they would be able to, you know, successfully overturn this unjust system and join together and all have rights. So they needed a way to um, break up that alliance of uh, the interracial working class. And part of how they did this was through um, what Du Bois calls the psychological wage of whiteness. So here's something that he said. It must be remembered that the white group of laborers, while they received a low wage, were compensated in part by a sort of public and psychological wage. They were given public deference and titles of courtesy because they were white. They were admitted freely with all classes of white people to public functions, public parks, and the best schools. The police were drawn from their ranks and the courts, dependent on their votes, treated them with such leniency as to encourage lawlessness. Their vote selected public officials, and while this had small effect upon the economic situation, it had great effect upon their personal treatment and the deference shown them. White schoolhouses were the best in the community and conspicuously placed, and they cost anywhere from twice to 10 times as much per capita as the colored schools. The newspapers specialized on news that flattered the poor whites and almost utterly ignored the Negro except in crime and ridicule. In a very recent writing, Adolph Reed was reflecting on this quote and talking about the specific historical context that um, it came up in. Uh, this treating white working class people a little bit better um, while not changing their core economic position in order to hamper the solidarity that would be needed 
for reconstruction. So, you know, some people who use privilege as a framework will point to this as like a precursor to this. And it should be clear that this is an analysis that's specific to this historical context and that it wasn't really intended to be applied in this sort of broad, generalized way that we use it today. Um, so that's sort of one part of the context for where, you know, racial differences in treatment and power are coming from in the United States, um, as well as like the specific historical context of where that's coming from. Following the unsuccessful reconstruction was Jim Crow. And Jim Crow is the name of a um, series of formal and informal practices that sort of sought to reassert this power dynamic of, in particular, like the white property owning political and business class of people above, in particular, Black people. And, you know, um, this was very horrible. It was a very terrible, uh, you know, set of practices and was extremely violent. And, you know, that this was in many ways a continuation of what came before. So the reconstruction was unsuccessful in changing people's relationships with each other and their practices. You know, it was sort of like a top down perspective and you know that's certainly something we can learn from as we you know try to build towards addressing these core problems is maybe approaching things in a little bit of a different way next time um so in response to jim crow is the civil rights era of the 1960s and 70s and here is where the nonprofit industrial complex comes in which is there was a series of uh, legislation passed due to the pressures and the activism of the civil rights period, in particular the Civil Rights Act of 1964, which prohibits discrimination on the basis of race, color, religion, sex, or national origin. And as a result of this, companies would sort of start to dabble in this like diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, stuff which was about this aesthetics or this representation of inclusion so that they could meet these legal requirements there wasn't really a goal to overturn the structures of power that kept certain people with less power and other people in positions of power and authority but what they needed was this structure that would show the government that they're meeting the minimum requirements for this legislation and so the nonprofit industrial complex sort of also is um, connected to that in that it provided this sort of support structure for, you know, this aesthetic. And if you are interested in learning more about the background of the nonprofit industrial complex, I would recommend you check out Critical Healing Moments videos where she has talked a lot about that history. So where we now see Peggy is a little while later. So Peggy is writing in 1988. She is working in a gender studies program. And so she's writing coming from her experiences as a white woman working as a professor in a gender studies program. So in 1988, she writes white privilege and male privilege. And then in 1989, she writes a shortened version of that, which has become popularized in how we discuss these things called white privilege unpacking the invisible knapsack so i'm going to read you an excerpt that appears in both of those pieces so i have begun in an untutored way to ask what it is like to have white privilege i have come to see white privilege as an invisible package of unearned assets which i could count on cashing in each day but about which i was meant to remain oblivious White privilege is like an invisible weightless knapsack of special provisions, maps, passports, codebooks, visas, clothes, tools, and blank checks. 
when she's writing this, it's coming out of her personal experiences, seeing the differences in how men and women are acting in the gender studies program, seeing how certain relationships start to deteriorate over time between men and women because of what she perceived to be male privilege, and her then applying that concept to her experiences as a white woman, thinking of herself as being privileged due to her whiteness. Um, she was in conversation with some non-white professors in her department when she was writing this. However, I want to point out specifically her use of the word untutored, which is that, you know, she wasn't um, so much like focusing on this as like an area of, you know, intellectual growth and study and like learning from mentors in the same way as probably what she did with, with her gender studies stuff. And that she's really clear that this is meant to be an autobiographical account of her own experiences and how she's understanding them. So while she does offer that up to people for other people to see and reflect on their own experiences, this is not meant to be this unifying framework that we're all using to understand all of these systems. It's autobiographical. And what she does is she lists a number of privileges that she believes she has and sort of how she views those. And it's a number of sort of things that um, some of those have changed over the years, right? Some of those are no longer privileges that are exclusive to white people. And that's because some of those privileges are easy to, you know, assimilate. So one example is she talks about a privilege of, you know, being able to speak to a white manager at a store. And due to the nonprofit industrial complex and the diversity, equity, inclusion, and because of um, her framework that has spread, is we now can find in many stores that there are non-white managers. Are those people um, owning these companies? Um, it's less often, but it also does happen. But also, are those companies acting notably differently because of their ownership by non-white people or other um, minority populations? I would argue no. And so I think like some of these privileges are taken out of this context and sort of isolated and used to say like, we're making progress on these things. And even though I would critique Peggy's um, perspective, I think like her, she sort of lacks a theory of change and that this is not as systemic as it can be. She's very clear that like power or privilege is like connected to power, which is the permission to dominate, and that this is a way to see systems, but that it's like not in and of itself enough to see all of that stuff. It's sort of a way of talking about how are individual people brought into these systems? What is their role? That's what she was looking at. It's not meant to sort of stand on its own. Um, she also is specific in saying that people who have privilege, in particular white people with privilege, are also harmed by that privilege. So it's not like zero sum, only one person can be harmed. Um, I think that's important. So post Peggy, um, just a little bit about how the nonprofit industrial complex operates before getting into picking up this thread again. So a book that I will recommend for further reading if anyone is interested is uh, The Revolution Will Not Be Funded, which is a series of excerpts from writers of all different histories and different groups about their experiences in the nonprofit industrial complex and like their perceptions and understandings of it. And so I'm going to um, just share a few perspectives from a few of these excerpts. So the first is The Political Logic of the Nonprofit Industrial Complex by Dylan Rodriguez. And he has a few talks up on YouTube, which I would recommend. He is, um, yeah, like a really good thinker. And so he talks about this environment of fear 
that is pervasive in the nonprofit industrial complex, how there is a demand to maintain existing structures because, uh, you know, if you're in a nonprofit and you're working on a certain issue, you don't want that issue to go away because if that issue goes away, so too does your job. So too does your ability to, you know, get funding and to be connected to other powerful people. So your goal is really to manage and maintain the systems of harm rather than to eradicate them. And in particular, folks with less power in the nonprofit industrial complex um, are sort of ruled by this fear of their superiors and um, their horrible working conditions. Um, another piece I'll share a little bit from is this excerpt from Black Awakening in Capitalist America by Robert Allen, in which he shares about how more radical groups tend to be less well organized, less funded, you know, by design, because, you know, wealthy funders are more likely to fund groups that are not trying to really address problems at the root. They're more likely to fund groups that, you know, that they find alignment with, which are groups that are not going to be threatening to them. So these more liberal, less radical groups will take the rhetoric, will take the labor of the more radical groups, and they'll sort of adapt it to their perspective, which is that, you know, essentially the system should not fundamentally change. And not only is this demoralizing for the more radical groups, but it's very difficult to maintain uh, sustainability with more radical organizing without funds and with, you know, the sort of, um, yeah, like the, the difficulties of living in this system without support. We pick up our story in 2018 with Robin D'Angelo and her work, White Fragility. Now this perspective and this framework is coming out of Robin D'Angelo's role of being a uh, trainer, facilitator for having conversations oriented around social justice that is propagated, paid for, conceptualized by the diversity, equity, and inclusion industry. So Robin D'Angelo is a white woman and she is writing about what she terms white fragility. Here is her perspective on that. Not often encountering these challenges to white racialized identity, we withdraw, defend, cry, argue, minimize, ignore, and in other ways push back to regain our racial position and equilibrium. I term that pushback white fragility. This concept came out of my ongoing experience leading discussions on race, racism, white privilege and white supremacy with primarily white audiences. It became clear over time that white people have extremely low thresholds for enduring any discomfort associated with challenges to our racial worldviews. Let's maybe just back up a little bit and talk about guilt and shame. I'm sure you've also heard of the concept of white guilt. So what is that? Uh, according to dictionary.com, which is certainly not the only definition, but is a starting point, white guilt is the feelings of shame and remorse some white people experience when they recognize the legacy of racism and racial injustice and perceive the ways they have benefited from it. So you see, shame is included in the definition of guilt. White shame is not a concept that is often talked about. So I would like to elaborate on how I differentiate between guilt and shame, as this is, a, this is something that comes up a lot in therapy. And I think it's something that comes up a lot as, you know, something that we, you know, comes up a lot for us all individually and personally. Um, so guilt, from my perspective, and people will have all different definitions of this, guilt is centered around this narrative, I did something wrong. So for me, guilt is something specific. It is an action. Uh, someone may have been harmed by that action. And I don't think of guilt as a negative thing. I think of it as an opportunity to reflect, 
and to be accountable for something that might have happened. Um, so that's what I think of guilt as. In contrast, shame is, rather than guilt, I did something wrong, shame is my way of being in the world is wrong. So shame is not specific. It is total or global. It is all encompassing. And shame is what happens when we internalize extremely negative self-beliefs about ourselves or about, you know, our role in the world. And guilt can lead to accountability. Shame leads to our bodies and our cognitive capacities, our emotions, just shutting down. Um, shame is very connected to various symptoms or experiences of trauma. Um, I think in a lot of ways, shame is a, re is a response or a way of internalizing traumas that we may have experienced. And if you'd like to hear me talk more about trauma, um, there is a video for you that I've talked about that. So how do we conceptualize where white guilt fits in with how I think about guilt and shame? Um, to me, it's a mix of both, but I think it falls much more on the side of shame where, you know, uh, confronted with systemic injustices that some white people will respond with a sense of shame that because we're white, our way of being is wrong. And because our conceptualization of racism is so individual focused, rather than to see the systems, that it's almost like we take all of that on ourselves as viewing ourselves as like personally morally responsible when that isn't quite the case. It's much more of like these systems and how, whether we like it or not, we're, we're brought in to play a role in these systems. And I think part of what's so confusing is because culturally in the United States, we don't often talk about guilt or shame. Culturally, there is a complete lack of accountability. And this has a lot to do with our punitive uh, legal system and prisons and police and our punishing systems. Because we don't really have accountability, we just have punishments. So guilt is always something to be avoided. So we just lump these two things of guilt and shame together and try to avoid them at all costs. Like culturally, that's that's what we do. Um, so I would say white guilt is just some amount of like collapsing of guilt and shame and really centered in avoidance. So this avoidance is because we shut down when, especially with shame, like we shut down and the shutdown is connected to not wanting to act, of sort of wanting to close off, become defensive, um, really closing off our mindset to new ideas and to other people's perspectives. So white guilt is very harmful. And this is why a lot of people will avoid being seen as um, racist is because that's like a way of people just shutting down. And so to avoid this perception, it's how a lot of, you know, white people in social justice conversations, it's how we can seem performative because we're trying to avoid any sense of guilt or shame that comes with the personal, like, because there's like, so individually focused on what the system is doing that we cannot accept that we personally are responsible for all of this stuff. So we avoid that entirely. And I would argue that white fragility is very connected to shame. Like white fragility is a shame based shutdown and response to, you know, this, um, what's being presented in these trainings is sort of this is like the nonprofit industrial complex is like like reason to exist is coming in presenting this training where people will feel bad and because people feel bad the people who are doing the training and who the people who bring those people in 
feel like they're doing something, right? Like they're impacting these people. They're making a difference. You know, they're confronting white supremacy. I think that's their narrative. And I think what they're really doing is they're causing people to become very defensive and to entrench their worldview so that they know like, oh, I really can't bring this up because I'll just, you know, be personally like attacked in this in this way. That's how they feel. And I I don't think either of those is fully correct. Um, but so I think that's what white fragility is. I think it's a shame based response. And something I'd like to return to is um, Peggy. In 2010, she returned to her initial document after it, it had been widely spread, it had been circulated, it had been used extensively by uh, people who were doing these sorts of workshops. Um, she offered some notes for, for facilitators, people who had been using her work. Here's a quote from that short piece. My work is not about blame, shame, guilt, or whether one is a nice person. It's about observing, realizing, thinking systemically and personally. It is about seeing privilege, the upside of oppression and discrimination. It is about unearned advantage, which can also be described as exemption from discrimination. She describes the list as being autobiographic, autobiographical and that the aim of facilitation for people to think about their own experiences rather than necessarily to challenge their viewpoints. So again, what I would say is like, really she's, she's focusing on people thinking about their own experiences and hopefully using those experiences to see the systems. Now I would argue that this framework is incomplete, the way it's used is incomplete because it focuses so heavily on individuals and it, it, they're not quite making the connection, either Peggy or the people in these trainings of how these individual experiences are connected to how these systems operate. Um, and also, and this is probably more important of a critique because I'm sure that some facilitators do include more stuff about how the systems operate. But my more important critique is that there's a lack of a theory of social change of what do we actually do with this? How does this lead us to action? Because the nonprofit industrial complex and the DEI industry, those institutions are centered around not changing society. They're centered around we need to continue to exist by feeding into the system and having this aesthetic that we're talking about these issues and doing something about them when the institutions that hold power are not being challenged. So I'd like now to talk about uh, semantic alignment. This is basically the extent to which you can use semantic shortcuts, such as, but not limited to, names, heuristics, jargon, and slang, and reliably have that usage result in the desired outcome, or a close enough approximation to use as a launching pad in order to get to where you want to go. In other words, semantic shortcuts are manifestations of shared meaning, while semantic alignment is my attempt at gesturing towards and measuring the presence of that shared meaning. What I'd like to do here is to take a look at my perception. So this is, I'm sure people will have other ways of thinking about this, but my perception of how, when we use the word privilege, what do we mean? And how is that leading to this shame response? And how is that not helpful? And then what, what should we have instead? So for those of you, if there's anyone who's listening to this video rather than watching it, I'd like to just give you a heads up that there's going to be some visual aids coming up soon. So if you'd be interested in that, you can um, look at the screen while you're watching this video. So the way I think about our usage of the word privilege is I think there's three main uses and then there's going to be some overlap and there's, we'll do like a Venn diagram type situation. So my understanding of these uses is privilege can mean access to resources. So this can mean having food, a car, 
having authority in some institution. It's sort of vague, um, but I think often when we use this, it's sort of vague. Um, the next piece is social location. So what is our identity and how does that confer privilege or a lack thereof? Often this identity is targeting like one specific uh, area or type of identity. And I think the last way that I often see privilege used is to frame harm as a lack. So specifically talking about people with a certain type of privilege lacking an experience of harm that other people who don't have that privilege do have that experience of harm. And now what I would argue is that there isn't ever truly a lack. So if we conceptualize a privilege that someone might have as not having a certain experience of harm, it is true that they don't have the same experience as someone else. However, some people being harmed um, is enough to have the secondary harm. Things like survivor's guilt or secondary trauma are very relevant here. Um, so if in a system, some people are being harmed for something more severely, other people are still seeing that, or even the ones enacting that harm that still is hurtful to them, obviously maybe those people shouldn't be centered in when we're trying to decide what to do about this, but some harm existing in a system, it spreads everywhere. It's a bit like plastic. Like I'm sure you've all heard about microplastics being everywhere in the natural environment. Harm is sort of like that. It just gets everywhere. So next what I'm gonna do is talk about some connected concepts to each of these. So in connection to, um, you know, having access to resources is responsibilities. So using privilege in, in the framework of having access to resources is you have a responsibility to use those in a certain way. You know, some people talk about it in that way. And that if people have those resources, maybe we can hold them accountable to use them. Now, my critique of this is that it does focus very heavily on the individual person rather than the functions of a system. Um, the next use of privilege, social location, what that's connected to is a lot of the time this is single access. So what does that mean? Usually referring to a particular form of identity, whether that's race, gender, body image, ability versus disability, etc. is that I think we really lack the context when we focus on one specific axis of oppression like we don't see how they're all connected because none of us is ever truly one thing and no system is ever one thing either so when we focus on for instance the existence of racial privilege or gender-based privilege that we're not seeing how people's lives are actually impacted by that because it's so multifaceted in the way that we experience them and the last connected concept here is the idea of a lack of harm. Now I've shared a bit about how I don't think there's truly a lack of harm when we're conceptualizing, like some people have harm, other people that harm looks different. So I think like when we conceptualize privilege as someone lacking harm, I think this is really where we see solidarity breaking down. So solidarity, of course, refers to our ability to see our experiences as interconnected and to want to support each other in those experiences. So saying that some people lack an experience of harm will naturally lead to our desire to connect and to do something together just breaking down because we're unwilling to see how other folks have experienced harm. We're competing to have the narrative that we have the worst harm in order for any of our experiences to be legitimized. And we have this experience of competing interest with different groups of people. So I think this piece is really important. This idea of privilege as not having experienced harm um, can be really hurtful. So next we're gonna talk about the overlaps in the Venn diagram. So one that I would say is connected to access to resources and single access 
social location is power, right? So if we're in this position, we maybe can think of conceptualizing power as an overlap of those two things. Um, however, that is a pretty limited understanding of power because it doesn't really see the systems and it's looking at things along that single axis. So it's a very limited understanding of what power is, where it's coming from, and how we can use it. And I think with that limited understanding, it comes with big expectations of ourselves or of saviors to come in. I think this is really where we see saviorism, is this idea of like, you know, someone having access to power, access to resources, and of seeing themselves as being along a single axis or even on multiple identities that, oh, because of this, I have to come in and, and do that. There's this almost responsibility to be a savior that this thinking can encourage. And so I would say, again, this is where it's like not a helpful framework. At the intersection of access to resources and lack of harm is entitlement. So for folks who fall into this category or experiences that fall into this category, there is this um, insistence that people constantly feel the need to affirm I have been harmed, but because they have access to resources, that insistence that they have been harmed leads to being entitled to certain outcomes or certain resources or to be heard in a certain way that keeps others out who have other experiences of harm and they lack those resources. So in this area, we would see people like just continue to acquire more and more resources because they view it as a competition that they're continually affirming. Like, I have to keep saying, like, I have been harmed, right? This is where people, I think you would see like, you know, the phenomenon of like a Karen, you know, um, like white women who might have access to resources and have been told by, you know, the men in their lives, like, you know, you haven't been harmed, but they know that they're deeply being harmed by their role in the patriarchal system of white supremacy that they then take out their need for their pain to be recognized by saying that people with less power, less resources than them are harming them because they're an easier target. So I think that's where entitlement comes in. At the intersection of uh, position and lack of harm is the loss of self. So in our current system, our sense of self is derived from, you know, our oppressive systems and characterized by the harm that we have experienced. So denying someone the harm that they have truly experienced is also to deny what limited sense of self we can derive from our experiences in this system. And you know, certainly there's other ways of defining ourselves, but I think we need to acknowledge the ways we've been harmed before we think about defining ourselves in different ways. So this like connecting to like having a particular position and then that harm from being in that position being denied is a way of denying our sense of self, like our, our experiences. At the intersection of all of these things is oppression Olympics. So when all three of these things are overlap, all of their intersections are overlapping, is this idea of, so what is oppression Olympics? This idea that we have to compete for our oppression to be seen as the most meaningful, the most valid form of oppression so that our interests can be recognized and so that we can do something about it. And this happens because we don't see our struggle as being connected, because we're competing for attention, for time, for resources, and because we're all struggling with the shame-based shutdown, that we're worried about being found out as not being valid or not, you know, being able to speak on certain issues because we do have privilege in certain ways. So, I would argue also that shame is pervasive throughout this framework, that 
we don't feel we can talk about our true experiences because of the way that this is being conceptualized. And so what do we do is people go on the attack. There is a competition in how we talk about these things. So next what we're going to do is talk about different critiques people have offered. So some of these critiques of the privilege framework are more accurate than others. And so we're going to talk about these different frameworks. Um, the first critique of privilege I'll offer is Ben Shapiro's critique. And Ben Shapiro here is going to be a stand-in for what I think a lot of right-wing critiques of privilege are likely to say. I think the problem with the term white privilege is the, is the unspoken assumption, which is that if you are white, you have somehow benefited massively by dint of your skin color in the United States. And that is a proposition that on the individual level, I absolutely deny. I think there are a lot of white people who do not benefit from the fact that they are white in the United States. I think there are legal policies in place like affirmative action that affirmatively actually cut against white people in the United States when they don't exist uh, you know, in the same way with regard to legal discrimination, like legally enforced discrimination against other groups. Uh, when it comes to the idea that we should all treat each other as individuals, and we should obviously examine our own internal biases. Of course I agree with that. I mean, I, th I thought that used to just be called decency. The problem with weaponizing the term white privilege is, again, the suggestion that if you are a white person and you've been successful, the reason that you've been successful is due to this unspoken privilege and bias inside our institutions. Paraphrasing, something he said is that the problem is the assumption that white people have benefited on the basis of their race. And the problem is affirmative action. So... Ben's perspective is, you know, don't worry about the historical context of what's going on. Like, we're all individuals. We're all born into this world, and, and you know, it's our own individual responsibility to do what we can to make it in this world. And so some people getting, you know, some form of, you know, opportunities in the system that are on the basis of their identity or their previous experience of oppression, that's actually harming people who don't have that identity. And he's thinking of this as reverse racism. Another way of thinking about Ben Shapiro's critique is that he's saying, we do not live in a society. We are all individuals. And any acknowledgement that we're not individuals, that we're members of groups, is wrong and harmful. So obviously Ben is wrong. We do live in a society. There is a legacy of these harmful systems that continues to exist and we should do something about that. So, you know, um, that said, in, in the clip I shared, he does talk about how there's a lack of a clear plan. I would agree with that. I think that the privilege framework there isn't really a clear plan. And so, you know, while he's 99% wrong, he is right about that. The next critique I'll offer is the way that some leftist people will say, let's not worry about these different things. Let's just focus on class. So I think this is a way for white leftists to avoid accountability for interpersonal harm that we may have been enacting in organizing spaces, a way of not thinking about how these different systems are causing us to interact with each other in particular ways. And it is explicitly racist and ableist and fat phobic, and all of these different things to say, let's only focus on class. Let's ignore this other stuff because class is the most important. That's extremely disrespectful to everybody who has more than just a simplistic class identity. Of course, class is important, but we need to talk about these things as being interconnected. Otherwise, we're not going to understand class. So. Speaking about this particular issue was Lorenzo Camboa Irvin with his writing The Progressive Plantation, which came out in 2011. He said, 
This structure of concentrated poverty and poverty in communities of color is clearly racism, but the white radicals are mostly silent or missing in action of the campaigns against it. We must demand that they stand up and join with the peoples of color. So he talks about how white radicals will talk a big game about what we'd like to do, but are completely absent from the struggles of communities of color. He uses this phrase, which I think is very insightful, which is analysis with paralysis, which some of us can fall into. And he also talks about how white radicals struggle to connect with white working class people as well out of, a, you know, out of a knowledge that those people are not going to immediately agree with them and not so much wanting to accept them. So talking about how these sort of white radical communities and organizing spaces can become very insular and isolated. And he specifically talks about Occupy Wall Street as an example of, you know, how this uh, perspective has influenced social movements and how it was, you know, um, he specifically talks about Occupy Wall Street and how this perspective has inhibited social movements. And I've also been in predominantly white organizing spaces where I've seen these dynamics in action. So this is very much conversation we should be having about, you know, are we meaningfully engaging with people? Are we making sure our spaces are welcoming for people, are we focusing on more than just class? Are we open to these conversations of how these other issues are impacting our relationships with each other? It's very important conversations to have. The last critique of privilege is the perspective of intersectionality. Now, to be clear, intersectionality has also been to a degree co-opted by the same systems which use privilege to sort of propagate their viewpoint. What I'll be doing is returning to the source material of what intersectionality and that framework is connected to because I think it provides us a clear alternative to the discourse we become used to around privilege. So in 1979, the Kumbahi River Collective put out the Kumbahi River Collective statement. And they had started meeting in 1974, a group of largely Black women, Black queer women, radical Black women. Um, and they were really seeing the failures of second wave feminism, as which was a largely white movement, very hostile to um, sex workers and trans people, and they, as well as non-white people, and also becoming disillusioned with the uh, centering of men in the civil rights and Black nationalist organizing. So for them, identity politics was about being recognized as having all of their identities, which giving rise to a specific set of experiences and how it's important to address all of those things at once in pursuing a form of collective liberation. It's very disconnected from the liberal form of identity politics now, which is a politics of representation, representing certain forms of identity rather than using this to understand how we're all impacted by the same forces. So here's an excerpt from their statement. We also often find it difficult to separate race from class from sex oppression because in our lives they are most often experienced simultaneously. We know that there is such a thing as racial sexual oppression which is neither solely racial nor solely sexual, e.g. the history of rape of black women by white men as a weapon of political repression. Understanding that these things aren't additive but it's when we're looking at our experiences as sort of all coming together at the intersections of different forms of identity that we can understand the dynamics at play. And Barbara Smith, who I was fortunate enough to see speak, um, talks about how simultaneity 
was the signature contribution of Black feminism, simultaneity being this idea that we are all of these things simultaneously or at once. Um, if you take home one message from this current video, I hope it's that you go and read the Kombahi River Collective Statement because they really speak to these issues in a very approachable way and a very deep way. So I'd encourage you to check that out. In 1989, which was a little while later, Kimberly Crenshaw um, wrote a paper which also came to be very influential in conceptualizing intersectionality. Now, this paper is coming out of her study as a legal scholar, so it is that specific context, but I think it also is something that we can apply to a broader context because um, it is that strong of an analysis. This is something she had to say. This single access framework for races, Black women in the conceptualization, identification, and remediation of race and sex discrimination by limiting inquiry to the experiences of otherwise privileged members of the group. In other words, in race discrimination cases, discrimination tends to be viewed in terms of sex or class privileged Blacks. In sex discrimination cases, the focus is on race and class privileged women. So what Crenshaw is talking about is that if we focus on the privileges of certain groups having privileges and other groups lacking those privileges, that it's the privileges that are not being discussed or talked about that come to dominate those discussions. So like she was saying, um, in sex discrimination cases, you're more likely to have a well-off white woman rather than a poor or working class black or other non-white woman because we're just focusing on this one thing, sex discrimination. We're not seeing all of the other factors at play. So what she's saying is, we can't just look at privilege as one thing that is there or is not there. We need to look at all of these things simultaneously. And I think that this is partly why we can shut down at times is because the focus is we're talking about one thing at a time and we really are, you know, sensitive about bringing in more factors. We're worried about being found out that we have privilege in a way that's not being talked about we're focusing on this other type of privilege because that is something that we feel we can talk about. So I think that's what can lead to shutdowns sometimes um, is because we're afraid of the complexity of our experiences. And I think it's really important to be able to talk about all of our ex experiences and to, to listen to the all of the complex experiences of other people all at once. In this next piece, I'd like to offer you my synthesis of ways we can use and think about intersectionality in contrast to the ways that I had framed privilege earlier in the video. So rather than access to resources, we can think of this as institutional authority. Access to resources, remember, was very loose, very vague, Institutional authority centers the systems and the institutions we're connected to. It centers ways that we have or lack power specifically. Next we have simultaneity or all of our identities and ways that we're perceived by ourselves and by the world all at once because to take things one at a time isn't really going to give us the framework we need for an analysis that accounts for all of these things at once. Instead of a lack of harm, we have spectrum of harm. So harm isn't something that's limited to one group or person at a time. I think of it as something that radiates out. So for example, um, one child who's being punished might be made an example of by being physically hurt by an adult. And while other children might not necessarily have that same experience, they're still seeing it. They're still losing a trust, a sense of trust and of safety in the adult who they now know has the capacity to harm them. There is a corollary with police, right? So 
rather than thinking of harm as either being present or not present, we can look at it as, you know, was there someone who experienced that harm, someone who observed that harm, someone who might have heard about it, someone who might have perpetrated it. What are the different ways that harm can be experienced? So that rather than saying, that's your issue, I'm not being harmed by that, this is my issue over here, we can look at it and say, this is how I relate to that issue. This is how I've been harmed by that system. Because we've all been harmed by all of the systems that oppress us. And again, I would refer to this example I gave earlier of plastic. Plastic is everywhere due to our global system of capitalism and our global production capacities. Microplastics are in everything, and there's really not a whole lot we can do about that at present. I mean, I'm not going to get too into this. There are some people working on a way to address this. Um, but it's a little like that. It's a little like there is plastic everywhere, and it's in the air we breathe. It's in the food we eat. It's in the water we drink. It's everywhere. In the same way, in an oppressive society, harm is everywhere. It is not something we can avoid by virtue of, you know, being uh, separated from it. But I would argue that people with more power and privilege, it's just their goal to remove themselves as much as they can. They never can fully do it. So in terms of the overlaps, um, if we're looking at the overlap of institutional authority and spectrum of harm, I would consider that to be proximity to harm. So that will show us how close we are to a specific thing that is harmful and how likely we are to experience a specific type of harm. And at the overlap of simultaneity and spectrum of harm, we have specific experiences of harm or what we can talk about as lived experiences. So this would be experiencing harm, witnessing harm, hearing about harm, perpetrating harm, or being in relationships with people who have any of these experiences. So these would be specific to us as individuals, like things that we have experienced because of our simultaneous, our simultaneous uh, multiple things that define who we are. At the overlap of power and simultaneous, at the overlap of, not power, sorry, um, institutional authority and simultaneity, we have class. So class is something that we can frame in terms of a binary, but in reality, it's so much more complicated than that. And we all experience it in these very different ways, depending on um, you know, who we are. And broadly, it refers to the ways in which we can influence or are influenced by powerful institutions. So in some ways, this binary of ruling class and working class is helpful in the sense that, you know, people who are one side or the other of that binary are likely to find common cause with each other. But in other ways, just defining things in terms of this binary causes us to leave out or to miss so much important information. So at the connections of all of these things is solidarity. Solidarity is where we're acknowledging all of the factors, all of the life experiences that we all have that are different, and we're working together to change systems. So we're able to see Someone else has this experience, and it is intimately connected to my experience, and they're different. We can learn from each other and work together to address these things that we are all afflicted by. So I hope that this video has cleared up some semantic misalignment. I hope it has given a framework for us to understand, one, what people mean when they talk about privilege, and two, 
you know, why that might not be a helpful framework in pursuing action and liberation, and also an alternative of intersectionality and how that can be helpful for us in building solidarity. Again, I'd encourage you to, you know, look into some of the resources I've talked about today, which are going to be in the description of the video, the Kumbaki River Collective Statement, the Progressive Plantation, and Kimberly Crenshaw's legal paper. You know, if you have the interest to check those out and, you know, don't fully take me as an expert on these topics because I am just sharing my perspective and people with different experiences and different frameworks will come to different perspectives that are also to a degree fruitful. Um, you know, really when we're talking about this stuff, I hope that this can lead to trusting and open-ended conversations with people in our lives. You know, that's that's really the goal of, of establishing a semantic base of thinking about things is that it can lead to conversations um, rather than these, you know, shame-based terminations of thought. So open-ended conversations, talking about what people mean when they're saying certain things. And, you know, also when we see discourse or conversations online, using context to see like what's going on and maybe some stuff in this video will help for that. What do you think about this approach? Is it helpful for you? Does it clear up some thoughts you may have had? Is it giving voice to something you may have thought about? Let me know in the comments. Hey, thanks for watching this video, and don't forget to leave your thoughts in the comments. Special thanks to my patrons whose financial support enables me to continue making these videos. If you would like to become a Patreon, you can follow the link in the description or in the All My Links link on my YouTube profile. Also, if you'd like to explore me being your therapist and you live in the state of Pennsylvania, you can follow that same All My Links link to my therapy website. Say you're coming from YouTube, and I'll see you in the next video.